North Korea is one of the most isolationist, authoritarian countries in the world. The government there is one of the world's least tolerant organizations when it comes to criticism of its brutal regime, ranking of course just behind Disney. So it shouldn't be a surprise when every single movie in this country turns out to be communist propaganda. And I'm not talking in the, every movie these days has some kind of political agenda behind it, but the proper, it is a crime if your movie is not patriotic enough. So I've seen a few of these movies, and so far, my favorite is order number 27. So welcome viewer, and if you're a subscriber, welcome back. So, order number 27 then. As far as I can tell, this movie came out in 1986, which makes it the same age as the original Top Gun. According to Wikipedia, Kim Jong-un makes an appearance in this movie, which is an awesome troll by some editor out there whom we'll never know, but Kim would have only been two years old at the time. So obviously this movie is going to depict Americans as exceptionally evil and corrupt, in accordance with propaganda guidelines. So to really appreciate the propaganda elements of this movie, you have to understand why the North Koreans have such a strong animosity for everything American. So in case you don't know, here's the incredibly abridged 30 second version of North Korea's recent history. In 1910, the Japanese occupied Korea and ruled it as a colony of the Japanese Empire. But, of course, the Japanese would later be defeated in the Second World War, and the Soviet Union and the Americans, who helped defeat them, agreed that when the Japanese were gone, they would divide the territory of Korea at the 38th parallel. In 1945, uranium got split over Hiroshima, plutonium got split over Nagasaki, and the Korean Peninsula was split in half. The South Korean government was supported by Americans, following a capitalist ideology, and the North Korean government was supported by Soviets, under a communist ideology. Thank you! Titan has freed us! Oh, I wouldn't say free. More like, under new management. However, there was immediate disagreement over the solution, and the governments of each half both believed that they should be in charge of the whole thing. And North Korea invades. They almost win this war. But then they don't. The war ends three years later. Um, uh, sort of. But what's important is that the United States participated heavily in this war by fighting alongside and supplying South Korea as part of their communism bad program. This, this is, is not okay. This needs to stop now. Because of this interference, North Korea blamed the United States for causing the division between the two Koreas, and they're still bitter about it to this very day. Like any film produced in North Korea, Order Number 27 is a propaganda-heavy film that emphasizes duty and loyalty to the state. Also, I'm gonna give one more bit of info before we start. I don't speak Korean, and I'm relying entirely on these English subtitles, so I'm probably gonna misunderstand something or mispronounce the names, and you're just gonna have to make your peace with that. We're only just at the production logo and I'm already hooked. Looks like an angry disco ball is trying to escape my monitor. It's also kind of interesting that the logo highlights the entirety of Korea, both north and south, as if the Korean peninsula is already unified under a single nation. Like we're zero seconds into the movie and even the production logo is communist propaganda. So we open with a training montage of North Korean troops. A training montage that apparently includes a heavy emphasis on jumping over cars for some reason. We cut to soldiers talking with each other in a forest. We discovered that there's an active war going on, and North Korea has been invaded by an enemy, and these troops are itching for their chance to defend the fatherland. From all the blogs and reviews I read online before watching this film, I assumed that the enemy would just be South Koreans, which makes sense given that the number of Caucasian people fluent in English willing to participate in a North Korean propaganda film is basically going to be zero. So it would just be way easier to make the enemy South Koreans, right? Everyone seems to think that that's the case from what I've read online. Well, no, the identification papers from one of the main antagonists of this movie expressly says that he belongs to the US Army Corps number 8 and we discovered that the Big Bad Dragon Squad is explicitly an American unit, and all the bad guys' army equipment is painted with the five-pointed white star of the American army. Also, nearly all of the uniforms of the bad guys in this movie have this insignia on it, which it turns out is the shoulder patch of the 8th Army, an American army unit that served in Korea during the Korean War. 
the same patch that appears on many American soldiers in the North Korean Museum of American War Atrocities. So yeah, I'm pretty sure that these bad guys are explicitly meant to be soldiers from the US of A, but they were just so unconvincing that most of the people who watched this movie assumed they were supposed to be South Koreans. So here's the main characters. We got Captain. He is the leader of the squad, and I've watched this movie like five times to make this video, and I didn't pick up his name once because everyone just refers to him as the captain at all times. But in my notes, I call him Captain Communism, so that's just what we're going to go with. We also got Kiladam, who is passionate about music, joyful and dutiful to his great nation, and loves his country like every other person in his squad. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's Jason Bourne. There's like 15 other members of the squad, but after seeing the movie like several times, I don't even remember their names or anything they do. So honestly, you can just forget about them. What about them? I don't know them. Fuck them. Also, I want to draw attention to the gun this guy is holding here. So in case you're not a big gun person, I want to show you that this is an M3 grease gun, a firearm manufactured during the Second World War by the United States of America. It got the name Grease Gun because it kind of looks like one, and it continued to see use in the Korean War. But the gun was pretty mediocre even by World War II standards, so in Korea it was basically just used as a cheap gun to give to like truck drivers and stuff to defend themselves, and the off chance that they ever get into a shootout. Oh, this is brilliant. So how exactly did this thing end up in North Korea for use in this propaganda movie? The gun probably got manufactured in Anderson, Indiana, and then was later deployed to South Korea, only to later get captured by North Koreans during the war, and then put into storage, I guess, until it got pulled for use in this random propaganda movie? Like, this gun has to have a story behind it. And I'm not focusing on this one gun just because I saw it in like a single frame and went into a deep spiral about it. This one prop shows up in like half of the shots of the movie. The Americans use it, the North Korean soldiers use it, some of the people holding the M3 prop can even be seen shooting other people holding the same M3 prop. It's present even in most of the hand-to-hand -hand martial arts fight scenes where it's not even getting used. My reasoning is that there must be only one prop company in North Korea and pretty much all they have access to as far as working guns is concerned are old World War II era firearms, so that's just what appears in the movies. Anyways, getting back on track, soon enough the soldiers get their wish and the captain is summoned to a meeting with high command. I love how the movie feels the need to clarify that the North Koreans in this scenario have already dealt a devastating blow to the enemy. Like, it's not relevant to the plot at all, they just they just want you to know that they're awesome and, and we're winning. But despite all their success, the dastardly American bastards have created a special unit that specializes in... Assault, blow up, and assassination. This special squad has been deployed with the express purpose of committing war crimes and atrocities, which is somehow still more subtle than Michael Bay movies. The squad receives order number 27, which details their mission. It's not explained very well in the movie, but the basic idea is that they need to meet up with a special agent in the field who will give them information regarding the location of the enemy war crime squad. Then they destroy that squad and capture some documents that pertain to the location of the enemy eye command. The captain goes back to his squad and gives a rousing speech about enlistment, service, and the glory of the motherland, etc, etc. <laughs> And the squad rests one last time before the start of their mission. And as they try to get to sleep, they are serenaded to the sounds of a... Accordion. Okay. I don't know why, but for some reason the accordion shows up in like half of these North Korean propaganda films. Like, does the prop company that uses the M3 just also have accordions only in their instrument reserve? So, on the way to the front line, we get treated to this song. These lyrics are so specific to the context of this scene that it makes me wonder if this song was written and performed specifically for this show. Because if that's the case, then order number 27 is a musical. Okay, well they sneak past the world's most blind spotlight operator and the destroyed American tank, which is actually a Soviet BMP with a white star painted on it. 
Once behind American lines, they don American disguises and pretend to be wounded, which is like three war crimes right there, but whatever. They infiltrate a train that's transporting injured soldiers back behind enemy lines, and their plan is to meet up with their contact at the train station. Or, if that fails, they'll meet at a backup rendezvous point. However, on the train they just happen to run into some of the Special American War Crime Squad, which it turns out is called Dragon Special Forces. And as far as casting goes, trying to find an American-looking soldier with North Korean people? That's not bad, honestly. The American soldiers are, of course, gambling and drinking on the train for more money to spend on prostitutes. But our bold, brave North Korean soldier just won't stand for it. And he breaks his cover and stands up for the young girl and we get our first action scene. Okay, but please don't let the lameness of this action scene fool you, because later we will get what is unironically some of the most intense, cool action choreography you've probably ever seen in your life. We now meet with one of our main antagonists, Jang Yong Dao, apparently in charge of Dragon Special Forces, and for some reason he's dressed like a noir detective with a bowler hat and sunglasses. And I don't know why they gave him this outfit. He looks like the third Blues Brother got lost in North Korea. With their cover blown, the boys escape by jumping off the train, and the Americans respond by blocking all train stations and starting a special search for the Kim Squad. We're then introduced to Special Agent Ballastine, who is of course unable to meet up with the North Korean squad at the first rendezvous. Uh, <laughs> The film occasionally cuts back to the Americans discussing the latest events, and I'm going to skip most of these scenes on account of the fact that they're basically just Americans whinging about how the North Koreans are just too badass and awesome for them to handle. So there's really nothing to say about this entire scene other than the fact that I really, really, really want these subtitles to be a perfect one-to-one -one translation. <laughs> Meanwhile, our North Korean squad is regrouped and continue on foot to the second backup meeting spot. On their way there, they pass a temple that has the most unnecessarily overdramatic reveal sound effect ever. Like, they don't even know that American troops are in this temple yet. Like, is every single establishing shot just going to be given with this overdramatic reveal sound? However, they are spotted by an American soldier who is sitting in a tree, alone, armed with just an axe, for some reason. The rest of the squad continues with their mission, and Kilnam is sent to deal with the American, and we finally get to see what is, without a doubt, the best part of this movie. The fucking action. <laughs> You see, these North Koreans might be holding antique World War II firearms, but the real danger is their guns. Because despite the fact that the North Koreans are armed, they don't fire a single round this entire fight. And what follows is just 10 minutes of uninterrupted action with what is unironically some of the best fight choreography I think I've ever seen in a movie. <laughs> They're doing kicks, they're doing flips, they're jumping like several feet in the air, they're making use of the terrain and stuff, it's absolutely incredible. I expect that some of these people have probably been intensely practicing Taekwondo for the glory of their state ever since the moment they were old enough to walk. And unlike a lot of action movies, it's not just a few seconds long. 
This whole fight sequence is almost 10 minutes of pure uninterrupted action as they kick and punch their way through the entire outpost. <laughs> Say what you like about these movies, these actors are kicking ass and loving it, and I'm 100% here for it. After the fight, we see Americans discussing the fact that an entire unit was wiped out by martial arts, and they include a subtle little thing that I thought was interesting. <laughs> You see, North Korea has a very long history of famine and food shortages, so it's interesting that this propaganda movie included this subtle little implication to their audience that Americans fighting each other over food is a relatively common occurrence. Meanwhile, the North Koreans run into an entire division of American soldiers. <laughs> And one of the North Korean squad members, nameless state fanatic number 24601, offers to stay behind and distract the enemy. I don't even know why you're giving him more ammo. This dude could probably wipe out an entire battalion of US troops with just his two Taekwondo fists. And after a little Metal Gear Solid roleplay, he's spotted and gets shot. This is obviously highly unrealistic. A real North Korean soldier fighting for the glory of his nation would easily take out a few dozen Americans minimum with just his bare fists alone, but they did make this concession for the sake of time. And as he dies... The music gets soft, the sun filters through the fluttering greens, and his life slowly fades away as he's prepared to give his life for his glorious nation. Uh, never mind, I guess. The guy just gets right the hell back up and continues to beat the shit out of a dozen American soldiers. Look, like, what? Did he use a health potion? You can't just give a character a big swan song death dialogue and then revive him immediately like nothing happened. Okay, whatever. They go to the second rendezvous point and they, we get an establishing shot of the cafe that they were supposed to meet the special agent at. <laughs> okay, fine, I edited that one in. However, it is a trap. They are intercepted by the Special Dragon Forces squad. And they engage in what is the biggest fight scene yet, and it does not disappoint. <laughs> They pull off these exceptionally long and intense fight shots with really long one-take sequences. Like, look at this. There's no sneaky hidden cuts or anything, no CG, they're just doing this all one take. Like look, their hats are flying off their heads. These kicks are making contact. I don't think there's movie magic or anything here other than the occasional sped up shot. These actors are just straight up beating the shit out of each other and it's unironically awesome. Yeah. Yeah! 
Sure, the camera work and effects didn't age that well, probably because it's filmed with an old Soviet camera that weighs as much as a bus, but the choreography and fight scenes here are unironically on the same level of John Wick or like the Ip Man movies, probably because these actors have been training in Taekwondo ever since they were old enough to salute a painting of their dear leader Kim Il-sung. Anyway, it takes several minutes of fighting, but eventually they do start using guns and we get our first proper shootout. And as you might expect, they end up mowing down like 10,000 American soldiers without any effort. And I'm not even mad at them for it. I mean, it's not like Hollywood films are any different about showing their heroes cutting down vast swaths of foreigners, especially back in the 80s. So this action scene is very Avengers energy and I'm 100% here for it. I just want to point out that this army car here with the US Army logo painted on it is actually a Soviet... Oh, never mind. It really is a Ford GPW. Just like the grease gun, I think that this is another prop that must have just been captured during the actual Korean War and now it's just a prop for propaganda movies. And I think that's awesome. Uh, what the, was this car made out of nitroglycerin? It's a Ford GPW, not a Ford Pinto. Eventually they escape to these tracks and this guy just climbs onto the bogies of a moving train in the most dangerous way possible. Just like the fight scenes, I'm pretty sure there's no movie magic here. He literally just starts crawling under a moving train while firing blanks at off-screen enemies. Like he's one slip away from being live leak footage. They discuss that they failed to make the second contact with Special Agent Ballastine, but apparently it's okay because there's a third rendezvous they could have made? This isn't set up anywhere, but maybe the subtitles are just weird. I'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt, just because of how cool that fight scene was earlier. And then what follows is probably the most dangerous thing I think I've ever seen shot in a movie. They do a big shootout and Taekwondo fight on the roof of the moving train. Like, this isn't the only time fighting on top of a moving train has been done in a movie, but I'm pretty sure there's no safety railing or CGI. I think they are just standing on top of this train trying to shoot these fight scenes, and it's insane. Like, I guess OSHA isn't here. You might as well just go nuts, right? During the fight, Kill Nam manages to decouple the train and cut off the Americans, but one of the bastards gets one last shot in and takes out our young aspiring accordion musician. No, I'm just kidding, the back half of the train doesn't do that. In fact, it's entirely absent in all following shots, and Kill Nam's position changes as he lies on the tracks. I don't know who is in charge of the continuity of this movie, but it's mistakes like these that are really reducing my communist patriotism. So they hold a makeshift funeral for Kill Nam, and guess who shows up? The special agent they were supposed to meet with. Somehow. Like, was Kill Nam's funeral the third rendezvous point? I swear these scenes are back to back, it's just not explained how they meet up with her. She just... appears. Like, maybe there was some other scenes that got cut in the editing room, but that's a pretty major thing to remove from your movie. But now that she's here, she points out the location of the US High Command as well as the positions of the Special American War Crime Squad, I still love that, and we're treated to yet another long patriotic speech. The North Korean soldiers deduce that the Americans are planning to move their location. Special Agent Ballastine returns to the American base to try and figure out where they're moving it to, but the man guy has deduced that she is a spy and confronts her. And despite the fact that he has correctly guessed that she's a North Korean spy, he straight up divulges critical mission information to her, James Bond style, and tells them where they're moving the new base to. 
The special agent makes a break for it, and we get another fight that includes this shot. Now, remember that this movie doesn't have CGI special effects. It's just not something that the filmmakers in North Korea would have had access to in the 80s. So, how did they get this shot where she blocks a knife with this wooden tray thing? Like, I don't know much about, like, drama and special effects, but I am 70% sure that they got this shot by just having some guy throw a knife at this lady's face as hard as he could and then hope that she blocks it successfully. I'm probably wrong, like, there's probably just some trick I didn't notice, but if I'm right, massive respect to everyone involved. I really like this shot where the camera flips. There's nothing more to add, I, I just thought it was cool. Wow, Oscar-worthy performance. She doesn't look like she got shot, she looks like she accidentally banged her knee on the wall. And the music gets soft, the sun filters through the fluttering greens, and her life slowly fades away as she's prepared to give her life for her glorious nation. Oh, again, okay, never mind. She gets right the hell back up and slips away to give the North Korean squad all the information they need to complete their mission. Like, I guess they didn't decide to go check her body. Was the guy about to finish her off and then it was lunch so he just didn't bother? So there's another patriotic speech. She reveals that the Americans have moved to has ha this place bay. I guess they didn't want to change the location again, even after knowing that a North Korean spy has successfully escaped with the updated information. And then we're finally in the third act. And then they make a plan to attack the new US base. But before we finally get to do it, we get what is probably the only heartfelt moment in the entire movie. Captain Communism was so busy managing his squad that he was unable to write home to even his own mother. So one member of his squad decided to write her on his behalf. That's genuinely a pretty touching moment, and it's one of the only scenes in the entire movie that isn't either pushing a very obvious agenda or just strictly moving the plot forwards. And for that reason, this is my favorite scene in the entire movie. We get a final patriotic speech about duty while Captain Communism lays out the plan, which is to blow up everything in the base, capture the enemy secret documents, and then escape by capturing an American battleship. The speech is written as if this is a suicide mission, and he pontificates about how even though they can't escape, they should still wibblingly give their lives for the regime. So I'm going to put that one on the counter. They take out a few guards and infiltrate the base via zipline, and I don't know how to describe it, but we get a bunch of random assortment of action shots that don't seem to be related to each other at all. They're blowing up a bunch of US planes in midnight pitch blackness, and then there's a guy in the middle of a field shooting at nothing. I think this is just like a bunch of leftover stock action footage and they just they just cut it together to fill in the final minutes of this film. And then again, we get the knife throwing trick. The knife even falls out, so it's not played in reverse or anything. I am 72% sure that they put a block of wood under his shirt and just hope that the knife throwing guy didn't miss. So the North Koreans infiltrate the base. That dude is just yawning, which is pretty chill given that the entire base is currently exploding. If I had a Raycon sponsorship, this would be where I'd insert a joke about him not being able to hear anything because of the amazing sound cancelling headphone features of the Raycon E25 earbuds, but oh well, maybe next time. They kill the main bad guy and take the secret documents, and then move to secure the American battleship, which they intend to use to escape. And yes, that's supposed to be a battleship, just go with it, we're almost at the end. <laughs> They also capture this American tank, and by American tank I mean a Soviet troop carrier with a white star painted on it. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's probably the same vehicle from the beginning of the movie. However, before Captain Communism boards the escape craft, he spots the Americans boarding a US Army helicopter. 
And yes, this American helicopter is a Soviet MI4 Hound with a white star and U.S. Army logo painted on it. He sneaks on board, and like most of the stunts of this movie, I'm pretty sure this guy is actually just hanging off the outside of this flying, moving helicopter, and he gives one last patriotic speech. But that's okay. I'm willing to sit through a little propaganda so we can see how awesome it's going to be when he gets on board and kicks everyone to death. Or maybe he hijacks the helicopter and turns the guns against the Americans. Given the action thus far, I'm sure it's going to be insane. So let's take a look. What? Like, I guess they didn't want to blow up one of their actual working helicopters just for this stunt, so there's a really obvious cut. But also, what? Did he blow it up with his mind? It doesn't mess with the fuel lines or anything. There's nothing I cut out. The music just crescendos and he explodes. D did he pray to the machine gods? If he had some kind of grenade on him, why didn't he just throw the grenade at the helicopter on the ground instead of climbing on and doing a suicide? Also, gee, it's too bad he had to kamikaze strike that helicopter. If only the boat they stole had some kind of anti-aircraft weaponry they could have used on it, that would have been great. Uh, well, all that's left is a long string of back-to-back -back propaganda speeches that lay out the thesis of this movie, and a propaganda song before the credits roll. Each speech is pretty short, so I'm going to be generous and count the entire remainder as just one and a half speeches. And then, that's it. That's the movie. So, what's left then? Order number 27 is actually kind of decent. On the whole, the acting is perfectly serviceable, the action is unironically very good. I'd almost consider it to be a top tier indie movie. I mean, I poked a lot of fun at it, but if the propaganda elements of this movie don't bother you, then it's unironically a pretty good film, all things considered, outside of a few cringy line deliveries. <laughs> Anyways, that's all I got. Thank you for watching, and subscribe, or I will show Tampa Bay residents that it's actually surprisingly easy and cheap to run for Congress. Man, nobody's gonna know if I don't get this bogey, like, perfectly cut out, right? Yeah, I do it for the fans.